Christian, and it's just so wonderful. And I could go on and on and on about this thing, but we have the unedited version now complete. Here is the uh, commentary on every chapter of the book of Revelation. We are going to edit it again. We're going to put all of our minds together and work together, and then soon we'll have the final uh, presentation and the final work uh, from the Spirit and Life lectures in the book of Revelation. Well, let's go ahead and get right into the program today, and we'll be talking a little bit more about what's going on this weekend. But our first speaker is Brother John Watson from Indianapolis. He and his wife, Tanya, are here. We're so glad that they have come. And uh, I introduced John at a debate just a couple of months ago with a, a preacher in Indianapolis. And I said, we've known each other for about four years. He said, no, two years. Boy, these two years seem like they have a lot of time comprised in them. Days is a thousand years. Yep, there you go. A thousand years is one day. But uh, I've appreciated John, and uh, before I ever met John, I knew a great deal about him. I knew that he was an interested Bible student and honest, because the only individuals who are going to come to the conclusion that Jesus returned in 70 is for some people to actually know their Bible and begin reading the Old Testament and respecting the time statements and keep an open mind to the Word of God and to allow inspiration to lead and then interpretation to follow. So I knew a lot about him. I knew about his heart. I knew about his desire for the truth. And when I met him, I wasn't disappointed. He was a good man all the way through. And I appreciate him. And he has taken the heat. Now, in Churches of Christ and the anti-cooperation elements of the churches, they're as tight-knit as any group can be. So when one brother uh, gets a cold, other individuals immediately you know, wear masks because they're so closely related. And when John Watson came out and said that Jesus returned in 70, he got the firestorm. I, you think you got the firestorm? We, he got the firestorm. He got attacked from all over uh, individuals coming out of the woodwork to uh, criticize him. But he stood strong. His congregation has stood strong, not without some consternation, just like we suffered here. But he's, uh, the Lord has steadied his ship, and he is just sailing wonderfully straight now. And he's doing a great work in Indianapolis. So what we're attempting to do in this lectureship is to review every chapter. Now, John Watson has the most responsibility because he's supposed to give the background of Revelation chapter 1 through 4 in one lesson. But what I really want him to do is just to introduce the book, basically refer to the seven churches and the audience relevance, and tell us a little bit about what's going on uh, with the immediacy of it, of it all. And so John is here, and we're going to let him have 45 minutes, um, almost to the top of the hour. And uh, the lessons are going to be recorded. We can watch them again on YouTube. Chad Kennow and his family is here. We're so happy to have uh, him and so grateful for his uh, technical ability. He's just a wonderful guy, and he's a great servant, and he wants to promote the truth of the return of Christ in 70. So now as we're about to begin, let's bow our heads uh, as we go to our Father in prayer. Our wonderful God in heaven, we are so thankful, our Lord, for every wonderful blessing which you have manifest in our lives. We're thankful, Father, for the world in which we live. We know that the profound order of it all points to a great creator, and we've learned to know you through your word and your son and your spirit tabernacling with us. We're so thankful, Father, for these truths. We're thankful for the brothers who have come. We're thankful for John, who is with us. We ask your blessings upon him as he speaks to us. Help us learn and help us gather information and help us uh, understand together. We might understand this mighty work of yours and grow closer to your wonderful throne and grace that's manifest now to us. So bless us today. Bless John. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. I guess this is on. Yeah. Well, I have to say, um, 
two years ago or four years ago, whichever comes first, <laughs> um, I heard about this, these two crazy guys on uh, YouTube, I think it was. And uh, my, my buddy Trent said, you got to watch these guys. And when I heard about these guys, I, had, I said to myself, there is no way that there are other preachers in the Church of Christ that are teaching this. And come to find out, they, uh, Trent was right. They were two crazy guys. I mean, <laughs> no question about it, but they were teaching this. And my wife and I came up here in October of 2016. We sat right back there on that, that back pew and was just blown away. I had no idea. I had no idea. I have to tell you this. Before I understood eschatology, I didn't understand anything. I thought I did. But it changes everything. Not for the worse, but for the better. I understand baptism in ways that I never could have understood before. And the Lord's Supper and marriage, right? Uh, let's see, what else did I get us on <laughs> or try to? But uh, uh, it has absolutely transformed my life. And, and uh, I know that I'm running short on time already. But I do want to say this. God bless this congregation for the work that you're doing and the stand that you take. Not only this congregation, but the people that are here. And not only that, but those who are not here that are joining us in the ether. There are those who believe just like they did in the first century. And that's, why do I feel like I'm in a witness booth here? Uh, uh, um, I, I'm used to walking around here. That just hit me. But, uh, but anyway, there are those who believe just like they did in the first century, and that's what we're talking about today, this, this audience relevance and, and so forth. Um, Brother Holger, you are way too kind. Uh, I just figured everybody would take this stand and take their lumps for it. And I know that when you believe the truth, just like in the first century, you're going to pay the price. You, you sacrifice relationships that you've had for years and years. And um, it's worth it. It was worth it. I, I heard a preacher when I was 12 years old, and this has stuck with me. And during a gospel meeting, he said something that was so powerful. He said, if you miss heaven, you have missed it all. And that's what standing for the truth is all about. Okay, so let's go ahead and, and talk about this. I only have uh, about 14 hours worth of preparation or, or, uh, sermon, or sermon or lecture prepared. And i got to squeeze that into now about 45 minutes or so. Is this, is this clock correct, yeah, actually? Yeah, okay, yeah, you got the okay so, um, so I'm going to do the very best that I, I can with this. But my approach to Revelation, and I, and I have to tell you this, um, I avoided Revelation like the proverbial plague, uh, biblical plagues. I avoided it. And, and some of the other passages, and I avoided Matthew chapter 24 and, and the Olivet Discourse throughout the uh, uh, Gospels because I couldn't answer questions. There were, just, there were things that were there right in front of your face, and you read things like Jesus saying, I'm going to return while some of you are still alive. Well, how do you explain something like that? You don't. You just accept it because that's what the Savior said. You accept it the same way that, that we accept all the other things that he said. So why would we try to twist these words and make them something that they're not? You know, Jesus said, if you're ashamed of me and my words, guess what? So, you know, that's Mark 8, verse 38. So we, we have a responsibility to this word. Revelation is not easy. But the easiest thing for me to understand and and I never really um, got the late date. It didn't make sense. So I'm about 17 years old, and this is one. This is my where my journey to preterism begins with the cons ultra conservative anti preacher that was uh, uh, became my mentor, and he's teaching the book of Revelation. So I wanted to listen to this and try to figure it out, and he couldn't figure out was it the early date or the late date. And he kind of went with the late date and, and stuck with that. But it never really made sense. And it really supported the premillennial position, if you, wanna, <laughs> uh, if you want my opinion on it. So it didn't make sense. But the early date does. So was Revelation a history book telling about things that had already happened? No, that never made sense. But it is telling about things that are getting ready to happen. And that's consistent with what Jesus said in the Olivet Discourse. Because Revelation is the Olivet Discourse. 
it's on steroids, of course. I mean, it's, it's uh, really pumped up, but it is the Olivet Discourse. And it comes from a perspective that it might be more unique than the uh, Synoptic Gospels, but it's chock full of information. But it's the same information, just a whole lot more of that. So what we want to do, anytime we, we look at anything, we want to look at whether it's a piece of mail that you find that's been unopened since 1945, sent to a sweetheart from a soldier overseas. We want to figure out when was this thing written? Well, how are we going to do that? Who does it apply to? What if you picked up a flyer from this congregation, let's say from 10 or 20 years ago, talking about having some kind of a get together or a meeting that you're going to have or whatever, and it tells you uh, the day as we often do, it's going to be maybe September 17th. Well, if we were to show up here on September 17th, is that relevant? No, because that's past information. It was for specific people at a specific time. And that's what revelation is. And for some reason, we've become so arrogant, I guess you might say, in our studies to think that the Bible's written to me today. Well, let me put it this way. The Bible, the New Testament was written to them, there, and then, not to us here and now. So when we look at it in that respect, we're going to ask these questions, the who and the what and the where and the when and the why and uh, all of these things almost sound like uh, uh, some uh, funny movie when you say, <laughs> say it like that. But let's look at a couple of these things. Who is this written to? Well, it states it clearly that it was written to the seven churches of Asia. We're going to ask the question, why was it written to them? Uh, in just a moment and answer that, but it's pretty clear. Revelation 1 verse 4 teaches that just as clear as it can get. So what is the content about? Well, this is concerning events that are to take place soon. If you look at this, we talk about this uh, inclusio, these bookends of the beginning and the end. It starts out with this verse, 1-1, one, one, and ends with 22 and verse 6. It's the exact same thing, exact same wording. And it's this word, tacos. A guy said last night, um, or the night before, I had made this point because he asked when Jesus was going to return. He's got to be coming soon. And I, and I define what soon is. Soon is with quickness and speed. It has immediacy. It's hastily. That's what the word that the Holy Spirit chose to use. That's how the scriptures interpret the scriptures. We don't even have to look at the word. We can see clearly that the indication was for them then and there, not us here and now. And that's how we have to look at this. So where? Well, obviously it was written in, on uh, Patmos. Um, I think I have this uh, somewhere here. So if you look at, at Patmos, Patmos is about 614 miles from Jerusalem. So you have to go all the way around the coastline, or I guess you could sail there, but I think the 1600 or 614 miles goes around the coastline and then, then to it if you're going to journey on foot or... Uh, cart or something like that. So it's, it's quite a ways away. And then you can see the, the churches there, but we'll come back to that in just a moment. So um, it was written there, and we see that. Just pretty clear. I don't know if it really makes a difference where it would have been written if it had been written in Chicago. Still the same truth, um, although there probably wouldn't have been anybody in Chicago at the time, believe it or not. When was this written? It had to be written before 70 A.D., Let's look at something here. I guess I should actually open my Bible here to this, right? So you look at verse 9 of Revelation 1. I think that this makes this pretty clear. It says, um, I, John, your brother and fellow partaker in the tribulation and kingdom and perseverance which are in Jesus. Uh, so he says, I'm taking place in this tribulation. Well, when is this tribulation? Are we going to put this at 135 or whatever that is? After the, Jerusalem is destroyed, well, that certainly is going to fit with what Jesus said, that Jerusalem will be destroyed and it will never be rebuilt again. So this tribulation comes when? At the destruction of Jerusalem. We don't have time to go through a uh, martyr vindication and all that thing, but, but uh, Jesus actually made it pretty clear at the beginning of the Olivet Discourse in Matthew chapter 23, about verse 39, he says, this generation is the one that's going to pay for killing the prophets. So it was to come in that time. So we could uh, look at uh, plenty of other things. And I know the guys here are going to go through this, you know, looking at Revelation 11 and, and so forth. So I won't, I'll leave that to them. But why would you write this? And I said just a moment ago, Revelation is 
It's just simply John's version of the Olivet Discourse. And, and of course, there's the, the Synoptic Gospels. Um, but it's the same message. So if we get any other message from Revelation than we got from the Gospels, the Synoptics, in, in what Jesus was saying there and what those writers were relating, then we're not being true to the text. We're not letting the Scripture interpret the Scripture. We're not allowing the Scriptures to speak to whom they were written to. And then we are going to just have an absolute mess when it comes to that. So I know that's all very basic stuff, and I really don't expect you to read all of this. This is just part of the commentary that I, I had, but I added uh, something here. But I want to make a point here. Why would you write Revelation to people who are 600 to 1,000 miles away? Well, think about this. this. To me, this makes sense. I don't know if it makes sense to anyone else, but we'll see. So here you have Paul, and he writes a letter to Ephesus, uh, Thessalonia gets um, some writings and, and uh, the Romans get their writings. So what about Galatia and all, all the others? So here you have just seven more churches that are being written to. It's not it's specifically to them, but there was purpose to this. So let me, uh, let me look at, show it this way. If you look here, the way this is actually laid out in the scriptures, these go in a circular pattern. It starts with Ephesus, goes to Smyrna, uh, Pergamum, Thyatira. I did not make this, by the way. I stole this off the Internet. So I don't know where it came from. There's no way I'm going to be able to make a graphic like this. Um, I will leave that to Daniel. That little coloring thing, that was awesome, by the way. <laughs> YouTube video. Yeah, yeah, that was good. But anyway, so it starts at Ephesus, goes to Smyrna, Pergamum, Thyatira, Sardis, Philadelphia, and Laodicea. And what this does is it forms a hub. It's like this, the hub of a spokes of a wheel. And so they would take the message from there to there to there to there and go and copy it and take it to the next one and so forth. And eventually this thing just fans out and everybody's going to be able to get this, this message, just in time, by the way. So let's go back to this. So this is one of the reasons, uh, one reason it was written to them at that time. But simply put, these people were what was prophesied. These are, are the diaspora. These are the Jews who had been dispersed. Now, why would they need to hear this message? Why write it to them? Well, simply put, many of these Jewish Christians were going to come back. We see that this is pretty clear in the New Testament. Um, I certainly don't have time to develop this, but they're going to come back to Jerusalem to perform rituals and, and sacrifices and worship and so forth. So the warning is, Jesus said, when you see the city being surrounded by soldiers, um, get out of there. But that, that even didn't make sense to me, by the way. Let me say this real quick. So you got the city being surrounded by soldiers. How are you going to get out? Jesus knew what was going to happen, didn't he? He knew what was going to happen, and he knew that Cestus Gallus was going to hightail it out of there and then come back. So that gave these believers, these people who listened and heard the truth and listened to the Messiah and believed the Messiah, that gave them the opportunity to escape and to flee to Pella, which we're going to talk about in just a moment. So I want to show you where Pella is at. Where's it at? Here it is. Okay, so you have Jerusalem, and it's about what? 50 miles, something like that. I don't remember exactly what it works out to. It's not very far from Jerusalem, but it was far enough to get out of the line of fire. Now, history teaches, the scriptures don't, specifically this, but Jesus did say leave. So obviously people who listen to Jesus are going to leave. So where did they go? They went to Pella. Eusebius says the members of the, this is this part in red, the members of the Jerusalem church by means of an oracle given by revelation to acceptable persons there were ordered to leave the city before the war began. Well, who told them that? Huh. Um, before the war began and settle in a town in Perea called Pella. So this is from Pseudo Clement and Recognitions 139.3. Um, so when we look at the historical account, we see this is just corroborating biblical evidence. Let's move on from there. Let's talk about um, the first chapter. Nope, I don't want that yet. Ah, we'll just, I'll just leave it up. I'm not much for PowerPoints. This is actually for chapters 2 and 3. But um, So in Revelation chapter 1, I don't have any PowerPoints. To me, this is the point, or the power is in the point here. <laughs> Jesus says... Uh, 
the revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave him to show his bondservants, the things which must soon take place, which we've already talked about this, Jesus knew. I am starting to see that Jesus knew. So here's Jesus giving the, all of that discourse in the Synoptic Gospels. And he says that uh, only the Father knows, quoting Zechariah to what, chapter 14? And he says, um, knows that specific day and hour. So when Jesus ascends into heaven in Acts chapter 1, and then he gives this information, notice what it says, the revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave him. Maybe he had a lot more specific information at this time. I don't really know. And he doesn't come out and say, this is going to be in X number of years. But it's interesting to think about that. And it certainly gives, gives uh, power to the point of the fact that this was written before the destruction of Jerusalem. So when we look at that, we're seeing some, some pretty interesting things. And you know that I'm already going to talk about uh, this time being near in verse um, 3. Well, the time was near. It's at hand. Now, there's not a man who has ever been married, ever courted a girl, went out with someone uh, and said, Honey, I am almost there. Calls her up on the phone. I'm almost there. I'm near. And then it takes him three or four days to get there. What do you suppose she's going to say to him when he gets there? Well, I have a, a pretty good hunch that uh, she's going to say, you don't understand the concept of time, do you? But Jesus understood the concept of time, didn't he? And he knew that the time was near. And he speaks to these seven churches and he says, I'm the one that's the firstborn of the dead. We don't have time to go through all these things. Um, I'm the firstborn of the dead. This is obviously 1 Corinthians 15. We'll just leave it at that. He says, I'm the ruler of the kings of the earth. I'm starting to see, by the way, that the kings of the earth are not necessarily, this is in Matthew 11, uh, 14 or something like that, where the kings of the earth are referred to as the ones who collect tribute. They're the priests. It's the priestly system. And we can see that through some other passages in the scriptures as well. As well. So we'll move on from there. He says here that every eye is going to behold him. We, I have to address this. If, if there's one thing in, the, in my presentation that I have to address, it's this. So every eye is going to see him. Well, what we need to do is look at what Zechariah teaches. And you, you know, I know that I'm preaching to the band here. No, wait. Choir. Did I get that right? I'm preaching to the choir. I'm pre Let's do it this way. I'm preaching to, I'm preaching to, the, to the preacher. Zechariah chapter 14. You already knew I was going to go here. Uh, I'm, I'm sorry, this is verse uh, Zechariah 12 and uh, about verse 10. But what you have to understand, and especially for those who have never heard this concept, because I was taught that Colossians 2 and verse 14 teaches that the Old Testament's been nailed to the cross. And we don't even need to study it anymore. Well, who came up with that bright idea? Because Jesus certainly didn't say that. In John chapter 5, 44 to 47, he says, if you don't understand the words of Moses, how can you understand my words? Just paraphrasing that. So let's, let's look at this reference. So here, this reference is being made by the Spirit, by John, by Jesus to Zechariah chapter 12. So what's the context of Zechariah chapter 12? Notice what it says. Zechariah chapter 12 in verse 9. And in that day, I was set about to destroy all the nations that come against Jerusalem. All you have to do is look at the context starting at verse 1. And when is this going to be? Somewhere in our future? I think not, clearly. Verse 10 says, I will pour out on the house of David and the inhabitants of Jerusalem the spirit of grace and supplication so that they will look on me whom they have pierced and they will mourn for him as one mourns for an only son and they will weep bitterly over him like the weeping of the firstborn. And in that day will be great mourning in Jerusalem like the mourning of Hadramimon in the plain of Megiddo. And what does he do? He goes through here and he lists all these families, these nations, these tribes. That's exactly what was taking place in Revelation chapter 1. And you would never understand that if you didn't understand where the reference is coming from. In the context of the reference, what you're going to do is pull out one little bitty part of that and you're going to say, well, everybody is going to see him when he comes back, so that means I didn't see him, so he hasn't come back. Well, that is fantastic logic. <laughs> That's not scriptural logic. Every eye is going to see him, even those who pierced him. And even when I read that, before I understood about going back and looking at the old covenant for things, my thought was, even the people who pierced Jesus are still going to be alive 
to see him. Why? Because that's what he said. It's just that simple. Matthew 16, 27, 28. Mark 8, 38, 9, 1, and, and so forth. It's just simply what he said. Those are the words of Christ. So what we're going to have to do to get around the words of Jesus is just do a lot of spiritual twisting, right? And that's exactly what we get condemned for. Well, I was listening to somebody, Brother Holger, he was raking you across the coals. Brent sent me the, the I think it was Brent sent the link. Um, I'll have to let you know about this because you're going to be interested. But so he says, we change the terms. Oh, really? So we look at the word soon and we say soon means soon. Well, that's, that makes good sense to me. They look at the term and they say soon means at least 2,000 years, if not 200 billion, because, right. because they don't know. So who's changing the terms? Right. Not us. No siree, Bob. Amen. We are letting the scriptures interpret the scriptures. So those people who pierced Jesus would be there because Jesus said they would. And all these tribes are going to mourn. And, and there's the context. So what is the context at the destruction of Jerusalem? What's the context already in Revelation 1? Things that are soon to take place at the destruction of Jerusalem, as we'll see as, as the letter progresses. So we already talked about um, Patmos there. And if John was in aisle, ex exile on Patmos, I'm not con necessarily convinced that he was. Um, it doesn't really matter because he wrote it. Obviously, he was there. That's where he wrote it. Whether he was there on a shopping trip, uh, you know, whatever, which I doubt that would have been the case, or what he was there for, the Holy Spirit, the Lord saw fit to give us this information. But he was there for the cause of the Lord. What was the cause of the Lord? Look at what he wrote. If that's not the cause of the Lord, then I don't know what is. There would be a lot of other things maybe we could could talk about about that so he says write this book the things that you in this book the things that you see send it to these seven churches which we've already talked about they needed to hear this to remind them that the time is at hand it's near he opens the book that way he closes the book that way to the jewish mind everything in between is talking about the same thing it puts it in the same time frame there's no way to get around that other than to twist those words. So I want to spend a little bit of time. We're going to jump forward here a little bit because I got a lot to go through with the seven churches. So uh, Billy said he was going to be gracious enough to just yield his time. He said he could do his presentation, what, five, ten minutes, something like that. <laughs> Four chapters here. One chapter down, we'll see. I, I told my wife, I said, well, that gives me about 10 minutes per chapter. Well, I'm a little over time on that first chapter. Okay, so here Jesus has the keys to death and Hades in verse 18. This is the theme. You know, we can look at a lot of passages. Jesus said to the thief on the cross, this day you'll be with me in paradise. Hmm, where was, where was he intending to be? I think a lot of our brethren think that Jesus was on vacation in heaven for three days, kicking back and taking it easy. And certainly Isaiah 53 teaches differently. When we, or maybe it's 54. That's just the way my brain works. But, uh, but either way. So here Jesus has the keys of death and Hades. 1 Peter chapter 3 and verse 18 teaches, what did he do when he died? He went preach preached to the souls where? In the Hadean realm. He was there. It was for a purpose. And he's going to tell you what all this purposes for. So I want to move on. Uh, no, no, there's one more thing I want to show you because I'm sure the guys are going to talk about this, if, uh, at least some, this idea of mellow. Okay, so in verse 19, he says, therefore, and I use the New American Standard Bible. I know it has problems, but they, but they all do, so I'm comfortable with these problems because I know where a lot of them are. So, so uh, Young's Literal, Interlinears, um, Maybe one of these days I'll become fluent in Greek and Hebrew and be able just to read it right straight out of it. But uh, till then, I'm going to have to do this. Verse 19 says, Therefore, the things which you have seen, the things which are, and the things which are about to mellow in the present indicative active, things which my version says will take place, but the things which are about to take place after these things. All of these things are grouped into what? The last days. The last days is what's is what this is talking about. 
Let's talk about some of the things about the seven churches, which I already have up here. So I, don't, I really don't need to be carrying that around. Okay, so you got these seven churches that have been written to. They've been told that soon it's at hand. Pay attention is what he's saying. Listen, because this is what the Lord was talking about. Now, years and years ago, whenever our, my brethren, our brethren, would start talking about Revelation, they would say that Jesus is going to come to this particular church. That never made sense to me. Because he said, I'm coming. He spends the first chapter essentially saying, I'm coming pretty soon. It's at hand. It's, I'm getting ready to come. So he's going to have multiple comings. Is that what they're really teaching? That's what they're teaching. Multiple comings. Well, I'm going to come to this church. I'm going to pull your candlestick before I come to everybody else. And before, now wait a minute. Is that really what he's talking about? So what I've done up here is I've, we've kind of isolated some of the things from an eschatological standpoint that I want to talk about. That's what I put in my commentary. I didn't go through all of the things, all of the moral attributes and, and moral lessons and, and uh, so forth, because people have done that a lot, and a lot of that's very good. But from the standpoint of es, es, uh, eschatology, I think there are a lot of similarities, and I want to show you some of these things as we go through these. Okay, so there's a couple words here that we want to look at, uh, Arkomahi and Heiko. And Arkomahi means simply, I come or go. So you, it could be, I'm coming, or not I'm coming, I come or I go. So it's, it's this way and then that way, depending on the context of the language. And I'll show you why I'm doing this in just a moment. The other term, uh, heiko, means I have come, am present, or have arrived. Now, notice what he says here to these churches. So every one of these churches, the Lord says, in one way or another, get ready. This is getting ready to happen. It's in process, essentially, is what he's saying. So in, to Ephesus, notice what he says in uh, chapter 2 and verse uh, five, he says, I'll just read this. Therefore, remember from where you have fallen, repent and do the deeds you did at first, or else I am coming to you and remove your lampstand out of its place unless you repent. So what does he say? He uses the word uh, er, uh, erkomahi. I'm coming. Well, wait a minute. Well, so what does that mean? I'm coming to you in 2000 years. Our brethren would never, ever say that. They would say he's going to come to them. Get it? They get it, but they don't. You see what I'm saying? Okay, so at Smyrna, he says, uh, look, we quote this verse all the time. This used to be one of my favorite verses. Do not suffer the mellow, <laughs> the about to. They get the mellow there, and it's actually translated correctly. Do not fear what you are about to suffer. Behold, the devil is about to cast some of you into prison so that you would be tested and have tribulation for 10 days. Be faithful until death, and I will give you the crown of life. Now, he didn't use one of these terms, 2064 or 2240. What he did was he used this imagery. When do you get the crown of life? When is a person able to get the crown of life? Not while death reigned from Adam until Moses. The crown of life comes when Jesus accomplishes all, when all things are fulfilled. He said, you're getting ready to have the crown of life. There was no coming here. He just spelled it out. He said, this is getting ready to happen. Let's look at Pergamum, verse 16. In verse 16, he says, Therefore repent, or else I am coming to you, what? Quickly. Now, wait a minute. He says, coming quickly. So for years and years and years, we've got this imagery, right? But let's put it into its proper place. Let's let the pieces fall where they should and the gears mesh correctly. This is a, um, sorry for all the Mopar guys, but this is a Muncie M21 slamming the gears and they are hitting perfectly now, right? I'm not even using the clutch. There are some guys that know what that means. I think Steve might be the only one and my wife. Oh, you know. It, well, if you know the Beach Boys, power shift in second and ride the class. Okay. Because you're trying to save that synchron, third gear synchronizer, right? But uh, back to the Bible. All right. So he says here, I'm coming to you quickly. Now it's starting to mesh, right? I'm coming quickly. They're not going to deny this. Let me kind of 
cut to the chase. We'll go look through the rest of these. But what Jesus is actually saying is, I'm coming, a general overall statement. It's going to be soon. It's at hand. And I'm coming to you. You are amenable to what's going to take place. This is the same reason that Agrippa sh st uh, stood there and his knees started knocking because he knew judgment was coming. He knew it. And he knew that he was going to choose to deny the Messiah and save his job. That's why he was so afraid. This is the same concept here. Okay, let's look at uh, Thyatira, verse 25 of chapter 2. He says here in verse 25, Nevertheless, what you have, hold fast until I come. So what word does he use? Until I come? It's 2240. It's heiko. Now notice what this is. I have come. I'm present. I have arrived. Did he tell them? Now, notice what he says in verse 25. He says, hold fast what you have until I come. Do you suppose that Thyatira is still around, holding on fast, holding fast? Somebody in here, I think, sent me a, a video or had it. I, I don't know, what, but, but it was on Facebook. So if it's on Facebook, it must be true. This 90-year-old Chinese grandmother was challenged to do the monkey bars. So I thought, yeah, she's going to grab a hold of this, and she might get two or three of them, and, and that's it. Oh, no, no. She grabs on one, grabs on the other, grabs on the other, goes all the way down and back four times. I'd be lucky to get four rungs, let alone four times. But she had to hold on to that. Now, after a while, you're going to give up holding on. You know Why? Because you start saying to yourself, he's not coming. Amen. Jesus knew he was coming. He told them he was coming. And he made it very clear to Thyatira. Sardis, chapter 3 and verse 3. So remember what you have received and heard and keep it and repent. Therefore, if you do not wake up, I will come like a thief. I'm going to come like a thief. Hmm. I want to talk about this idea of being a thief. For just a little bit. Boy, there's, there's a lot here. I kind of made mention of this uh, in the commentary, but I'll, I'll just try to go through this quickly. Jesus said, I'm going to come like a thief. Remember, we see this in 1 Peter 3, uh, 1 Thessalonians uh, 4 and 5, is the context there. Uh, we see it in the Olivet Discourse. Jesus said, um, He's going to be like a thief. But in Joel chapter 2, if you go to Joel 2, and you see that Joel 2 is preparation for war. He says it's going to be like thieves coming in through the windows. You ever known a thief that doesn't make preparation? Well, wait a minute. <laughs> yeah, maybe that's not the greatest example. But if you're going to be a good thief, you're going to case the joint. My daughter worked for a bank for a while. When she came in to open, they had to drive around the bank before they ever went in. You know why they did that? To make sure nobody was looking in the bushes, waiting there to watch, to, to see their pattern. If they saw a car more than once, they had to call the police. The same car. If it, if it went this way and they came back that way, they had to call the police. and They couldn't go into the building until everything was clear. Because everybody knows that a thief plans, a good one anyway, and Jesus said, these plans are in work, in the works. And so notice what he says, I will come like a thief. And you will not know. Because I'm good at it. These plans have been made. That's the idea there in Joel 2. Th that's just amazing to me. So you look at Joel 2 and Joel 3, and there's, there's kind of the concept. And the, being a thief is there. Let's look at Phila uh, Philadelphia for just a moment. And here he says, he uses Arcomahe, and he says, I'm coming quickly. Let's look at the verse itself. So he says, I'm coming quickly. I am coming quickly. Hold fast what you have so that no one will take your crown. Wait a minute. Hold fast so nobody will take your crown. Our brethren are still looking for that crown. They think it's something in a box of 48 different colors. It's not. 
That's something that is, Paul understood that this is something that is awarded to those who overcome. Right? And we overcome in Jesus. And when we're added to the body today, you know, this is where the rubber hits the road, guys. And this is full on pause attraction, which is, by the way, is a General Motors term. <laughs> uh, it's, and, and it's full on there. And it is just and it is there. When we're added to the body today, we're clothed in Jesus. We're seated in heavenly places with him. We had this discussion. Uh, this is a little off topic, but we had this discussion recently. Can you be more saved when you die? It's impossible. It's impossible for you to be more saved when you die. If Jesus has defeated death, he's conquered all that, he is, reigns victorious, but yet our brethren can't understand Matthew 16, verse 28. Hmm. You know what? The Hadean realm no longer blocks the way and the entrance of the church. It's done. It's taken out of the way. That's the message of Revelation. Let's keep on going with this. So at Laodicea, he says here in uh, chapter 3 and verse 20, he says to Laodicea, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in to him and dine with him. Okay, so he's standing at the door. He says, I'm going to knock. If any man opens the door, I'm going to come in and dine. This is wedding language. Plain and simple. This is something I learned recently. I also learned that they had lots of different wedding, wedding rituals, some more popular than others, but this one was relatively popular. So you have the bride and the groom, and they are betrothed, and they go through all of these rituals, and he goes to his father's house. The imagery here is just amazing. He goes to his father's house, and he prepares a place for his bride. Then when he's just about done, by the way, if you're building a house, you're the one building the house, do you pretty much know when... You're putting that last nail in. The, the finished trim is going up. The father looks at him and says, Okay, son, go get your bride. So he goes and makes, makes this uh, great uh, deal going through the city, and he gets his bride. Then they come back, and they go into the wedding chamber, the chupa, I think is what it's called. And there they would be for several days. They would have two witnesses there to, uh, to witness the consummation, uh, to make sure that, the bride was pure and chaste. Then at the end of, of the time period, seven days, whatever it would be, the bridegroom would come to the chamber door and he would knock. And the two witnesses were outside of the door. And they opened the door. And guess what? The feast is on the other side. So Jesus here is using this wedding imagery and he says, what? If I'm at the door, if anyone hears my voice, it's time. I'm knocking. He says, I will come into him and will dine with him and he with me. I want to show you something from Isaiah chapter 25. And this is just powerful stuff. So Jesus is using this imagery He's talking about this feast. We now know that it's part of the wedding. And what is the wedding that's getting ready to take place? All these guys in here are going to be talking about this wedding, this marriage of the Lamb. And we notice here in verse 6, The Lord of hosts will prepare, this is Isaiah 25, 6, a lavish banquet for all peoples on this mountain, a banquet of aged wine and, a, and choice pieces with marrow and refined wine, uh, refined and aged wine. On this mountain he will swallow up the covering which is over all the peoples. He's talking about Sheol here. Even the veil which is stretched over all nations. And he will swallow up death for all time. And the Lord God will wipe away all the tears from all the faces. And he will remove the reproach of his people from all of the earth. For the Lord has spoken. When is this feast? It's at the marriage. Notice what he says, verse 9, And it will be said in that day, Behold, listen to this, This is our God for whom we have 
waited that he might save us. This is the Lord from whom we have waited. Let us rejoice and be glad in his salvation. That sounds awful reminiscent of what we read in Hebrews 9 and verse 28. Hmm. The pieces start to fit. The gears mesh together and it works. We see there as he closes this, this specifically addressing these seven churches. He says, he who overcomes, I will grant to him to sit down with me on my throne. As I have also overcome and sat down with my father on his throne. He who has an ear, let him hear what the spirit says to the churches. All men are born with ears under normal and correct circumstances. I think this point's valid. I've heard this, whether it's from an anti-preacher or what we call liberals or conservatives. You know, I never, I never, just for the record, I never bought into that stuff. Either you're faithful or you're not. Amen. We have autonomy in, in our congregations and we can make um, judgment calls on certain things that another congregation may not and still both be okay. Hmm, Romans 14, ring a bell, anybody? You know, kind of deal. The concept is amazing that we can all hear this. And understand this alike. And even Peter said that, no, you don't get to interpret these things. First Peter 1, 10 or something like that, I don't remember. Uh, there's no private interpretation of these things. So when we look at these things and we see some, some of these eschatological similarities, this is the same message, not only to to Ephesus and Smyrna, Pergamum, Thyatira, Sardis, Philadelphia, and Laodicea. But it's the same message that was preached to the brethren in Rome, the brethren at Corinth, the brethren at Thessalonica. It's the same message that Jude gave and Peter gave. There is no difference. It's consistent. Amen, Brother Holger. It's consistent. It's consistent. It's what Jesus said. So how do we put all these, this uh, coming soon and all these other things in the time frame? Of the first century, because that's when Jesus said when we was going to happen. When we look at terms like mellow about to be. We put it in the context of what Jesus said. Now, let's see if I can do any justice whatsoever to chapter four. By the way, who's the next guy that has four chapters to go through? <laughs> I, I, I'll tell you what. Um, and I, I'm just simply going to say one preacher with qualifications to do four chapters. And you're the guy. <laughs> I think I was just the first one that you talked to, maybe. <laughs> I, and I said, I'll, I'll do Revelation one. And he's like, well, I'll just do the first four. And I'm like, OK. All right. So anyway, um, this is without question an absolute honor to not only talk to, to the brethren here, um, but to be able to talk about the things of the king and to honor and revere him in front of men, take our lumps and it's going to happen. But you know what? We are standing up for the Lord. Let me see if I can do a little bit here and, and leave a little uh, bumper time. Revelation chapter four. Let me work in reverse here. Chapter 4 basically establishes the sovereign authority, deity, and omnipotence of the Lord to do as He wishes and to bring to fruition the things prophesied of old at the appointed time. Ezekiel 12, Amos 3, 7, Joel 2, 28, 3, 1, 1 Peter 3, 10, Matthew 5, 7, 18, Revelation 6, uh, 16, and 17, and 10, 6, and 7. Okay, so there's chapter 4. Let me see if I can explain a little bit of that in, in a couple minutes. Revelation chapter 4 is essentially taken from Ezekiel chapter 1. Um, let's, let's examine this just, uh, just, just quickly here. Okay, so Ezekiel chapter 1 uses a lot of the same imagery. Um, okay, we'll get over here. Uh, listen to some of the things that are used here. So 21, or Ezekiel 1, 22 to the end of the chapter. He says, Now over the heads of the living beings was something like an expanse, like the awesome gleam of crystal spread out over their heads. 
Under the expanse, their wings were stretched out straight, and one toward the other, and also two wings covering its body, and one on the other side, and on the other side. But notice some of these, these, these imageries that's used. It's also used in, obviously, in the book of Revelation, verse uh, chapter 4 also. 24 says, I heard the sound of their wings like the sound of abundant waters as they went like the voice of the Almighty. I started seeing that a lot of times you see this idea of waters and it's, it's God talking. The voice of the Almighty. A sound of a tumult like the sound of, of an army camp. Notice what he says here in verse uh, 26. He says, Above the expanse was over their heads was something resembling a throne like lapis lazuli in appearance. And on that which resembled a throne... High up was a figure with the appearance of a man. Then I noticed the appearance of his loins upward, something like... I wonder if this is the same loins Daniel was talking about the other day. Um, uh, anyway, it just hit me, Daniel. Sorry about that. Uh, and it resembled a throne. And uh, uh, high up was a figure and the appearance of a man. And then I noticed the appearance of the loins and upward, something like glowing metal that looked like fire all around and within it. And the appearance of his loins was downward, and I saw something like fire, and there was a radiance around him. As for the appearance of the rainbow, this is the same, you know, this is Revelation 4.3. Uh, as the appearance of the rainbow in the clouds on, on a rainy day, so was the appearance of the surrounding radiance. Such was the appearance of the likeness of the glory of the Lord. And when I saw it, I fell on my face, and I heard a voice speaking. We see John falling on his face, falling down. He had to be touched to bring life back to him. It's the same thing that happened to Daniel. We see this happening over and over again. The imagery here is astounding, and it resonates with the message of Ezekiel chapter 1. And by the way, Ezekiel chapter 1 is not talking about spacecraft. <laughs> yeah, where do, they, where do they get this stuff? I wonder. It sells books, though, but, but it's, that's not what it's talking about. So in the fourth chapter, and, and we're, just, we're just so out of time, that's the idea. I, I really see that as being the idea. Um, this, this, this glass before the throne, we're seeing a judgment scene here taking place. We're seeing, uh, I mean, really, look at how chapters 5 and 6 unfold. This is, this is how it starts. And I know Billy's going to do a good job uh, unfolding this idea even more. I'm out of time, and I certainly don't want to... Uh, cramp this up any, but I do want to say again, thank you for this opportunity. Not, not to be here to preach. That I am absolutely thankful for and honored and humbled. Uh, you have no idea how much this makes me sick to my stomach. <laughs> uh, talking to my wife. It's in a good way. It's in a good way. But the opportunity to defend our Lord Amen. and His words is what this entire conference or lectureship is all about. That's, that's it. That is the bottom line. And that's what we're doing. Jesus said, I'm going to come back. Some of you will still be alive. And do you know the spiritual ramifications for us today? It's far more powerful than hope that has never materialized. Right. Amen. And I'll leave you with that. Thank you so much. Oh, I Thank forgot you, the white um, stone. Chad, put this back up on the uh, board just real quick. This last chart for us, please. Thank you. The, he needs a microphone. Oh, oh, I, oh I forgot I had it on here. <laughs> Thank you, Chad, for reminding us of these things. The only time I need a mic microphone is for recording purposes. Um, they <laughs> the brothers can hear me. Um, now, this is powerful. Thank you, John. We really appreciate that. And uh, as I recall, I think you requested the introduction. You just didn't know I was going to give you chapter four with that. We had uh, another brother who was going to come for chapter four. He backed out, and I just gave him another chapter. So, um, but the book is written, and he's done a great job, and we're going to uh, put this book out uh, soon. It won't be in a couple of thousand years. But notice what John points out. Now, there are seven churches that are addressed. Jesus promised to come to each of the congregations. Now, our futurist brothers will say, well, there are many comings. They got more comings in the post office. Okay? Jesus was promising to return. He was coming quickly. He's either going to come for judgment and take away that lampstand, or he's coming to deliver the crown of life 
what would it be? It was in the already but not yet. This is powerful. That's powerful. There's no answer for that. He was coming quickly in the same sense that the me message was at hand. And so I just think this is great. And the more we present these topics, the more it ought to resonate. And when honest folk, honest brothers, look into this word and see these truths, it will, it cannot be gainsaid, cannot be contradicted. Thank you so much. Thank you for coming. And thank you for the great lesson. We're going to stop. We're, I know we're behind already. We're going to stop for five minutes. Steve, what did you want to say? Oh, I thought you wanted to say something. You usually want to say something when I say something. So we're going to, <laughs> we're behind all right. Uh, so we're going to take a break for five minutes, bathroom break, and then Billy Williams will come, and then we'll try to get back on track for the top of the hour. Thank you, John. Again, thank each of you for coming. God bless.